All right, thanks for coming. I know how tough it must be to, to uh, have me as the last uh, barrier between you and vacation. Um, look, when Heidi uh, wrote me, I said I'd love to come, but I don't work on criminal law. Um, I did write one paper um, about a different way of thinking about the trajectory of the field of international criminal law. Um, it's not purporting to be comprehensive. It's, it's sort of from the perspective of a book I'm trying to do now about the rise of endless humane war. Um, and so you'll see that there are connections between the way I would like to tell the story of international criminal law and, and that, that set of concerns. Um, I don't know how many people got or read the paper that was sent. I'd love to just spend you know, a half hour kicking around the main ideas in the paper and then hear what you think because this is still open to change and this larger project I'm interested in um, is certainly just uh, at the beginning. So um, I'll start as I started this um, paper, um, th uh, the research for it, um, with something that surprised me when I read it um, in the midst of the great debate at the end of World War I about whether to try the Kaiser. Uh, the German emperor, uh, and for what? Now, of course, he wasn't tried in the end, but much discussion transpired at the end of uh, World War I about what he had done wrong. And not only uh, was the legal uh, uh, a bill that was made out uh, for him um, surprising, didn't include um, atrocities or the conduct of World War I. Um, uh, instead, it was focused on his initiation of World War I. But more surprising, if you look through the public rhetoric uh, around this crime, it was widely called, including by senior statesmen, a crime against humanity. Uh, and I found this really surprising for a reason I'll mention in retrospect. Um, I haven't done any of my own original research on this, but if you just look at Gary Bass's book, which is still probably the best single book on the prehistory of international criminal justice, you'll find that in a sense without noticing it, Gary lists all of these instances in which uh, lawyers and senior statements, statesmen use the phrase crimes against humanity to, concern, to, to uh, refer to the initiation of World War I. And here's just more evidence to that effect. I'm just going to move this so I can see one of these well enough. Um, uh, now, of course, the Kaiser wasn't tried for this crime or for anything. But I thought, what if we take the incidence of this rhetoric? Um, not only that what we would now call aggression was the crime that Wilhelm had allegedly committed, um, but that it was called a crime against humanity as the starting point for a somewhat different narrative of where international law, uh, criminal law came from than the one to, to which we've become uh, used. So I, I, I don't want to give too stereotyped a, uh, an understanding of the standard narrative of the origins of international criminal law, except that I have to because it remains so powerful and strong among so many people and especially the general public. The standard narrative, I believe, goes like this. The Jews were slaughtered in World War II. The world understood finally that sovereignty, the sovereignty of states, uh, and their leaders to act with impunity had to be ended or qualified. Uh, at the Nuremberg trial uh, after World War II, there was an initial attempt to take that bold step. Uh, and then uh, that fledgling uh, a breakthrough, interrupted by the Cold War, was picked up after the Cold War uh, uh, and uh, institutionalized for our time in the series of ad hoc tribunals and then climactically in the International Criminal Court. Now, what's interesting about this is that most of those who have looked back before Nuremberg for the prehistory um, have assumed, like the standard narrative, that it was an atrocity trial 
and looked back for antecedents of that, um, that kind of concern. Even with respect to the phrase crimes against humanity, Bass and others, though we have so much evidence that it was used to refer to aggression, look for the prehistory of that particular phrase um, f uh, as it referred to um, something else, uh, 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 ethnic violence. Uh, so just as an example, historians have made a great deal of this 1950 allied note, um, which is sometimes seen as like a missed opportunity to decry the Armenian genocide. Uh, and of course, it's true that the phrase uh, uh, crimes against humanity, um, although the phrase crimes against Christianity had been used throughout the 19th century is used in this allied note. Um, but no one could deny that the rhetoric in 1918 referring with this phrase to something else, namely aggression, dwarfed any uh, such uses, usages. And yet this is what gets emphasized because the standard narrative wants to attribute deep roots essentially to our priorities. The attempt to single out atrocity as the worst thing that can happen and as the chief uh, uh, end uh, uh, of, uh, of international criminal law in our day. Just so you're convinced that I'm not giving some unfair rendition of the standard narrative, we just uh, can note that there are two new books that have picked up this 1990s narrative about history uh, uh, and, and uh, revive them almost without alteration for our day with the difference that uh, they're really uh, about one's own involvement in this story. Um, Philippe Sands very famously uh, now has told a story about his own family intersecting with those who it turns out peripherally um, uh, uh, dealt with ethnic atrocity uh, at Nuremberg, uh, uh, leading of course to his own storied career in a targeting atrocity through international criminal prosecution. Uh, and for a local Canadian example, bestseller in this country, you may know of Payam Achavan's Massey lectures, which um, are, are, aren't exactly the same, but tell a, a basically similar story about um, unending victimhood uh, with elites uh, turning a blind eye until Nuremberg actors saw that atrocity is terrible and our generation embraced the mission of, uh, of, of penalizing it. Um, and and he, he uh, like Sands, goes further and identifies this concern with so-called global justice. Um, now, and the truth is that no one ever said they wanted to end them impunity until a couple decades ago. Uh, I'll show you a few of these engrams, which is about as far with digital humanities as I get. Um, maybe it's true that they said it using other words, but it's quite interesting that the, the current uh, campaign um, to end impunity, i.e. for atrocity, um, is, is pretty recent. Um, and, and what I'm trying to do above all in this uh, paper and talk is to give a somewhat different backstory to this undoubtedly very significant uh, phenomenon in our day. So what would a counter narrative to it look like? I'll go through a few stages of a proposed counter narrative. The one, one, the one step, I think, probably the essential step, which I need to do more research on, looks back before World War I to the first attempts at thinking about reforming uh, the incidents of war in the interstate system. Uh, and, and then we've, we've looked slightly uh, kind of out of order at that uh, post-World War I moment. I'll look a, a bit more at uh, the 1945 moment and uh, Nuremberg just to establish what I think the real analytical problem is. And I'm going to characterize it in two separate ways. Um, first, there's explaining the fall of the massive priority given to the criminalization of aggression in the international system as a, at a, as a first threshold and independent problem to solve once we realize that that's what international criminal law was originally about. Uh, and then there's this second 
a step or problem, um, which is thinking about the intensification of interest uh, uh, in atrocity and its criminalization. So, you know, not to get into too much detail, but um, I think it's quite important to begin by understanding that the 19th century is the first century in which there were peace movements. Um, it became plausible to think that organized human activity could put an end to war, um, not as some you know, fulfillment of prophetic uh, uh, you know, fantasies, but in real time and in our lives. Uh, and in fact, peace movements burgeoned I think in the 19th century far more regularly than in any later time with the exceptions of the 20s and the 1960s. Um, and they set up like a big debate among, amongst reformers about how to pursue the strategy. And basically what I'd like to propose is that um, um, uh, alongside the goal of the outright abolition of war through social action and pressure on states, including uh, perhaps even mainly women, women's internationalism. There was this second project, uh, making war more humane. Uh, and I want to investigate the extent to which it wasn't really separate uh, in its origins, um, but rather was a secret strategy of the pacifists. If you look at what the, the, the real founder and leader of the ICRC, and, and led it, who led it for decades, this uh, Swiss gentleman, Gustave Moignier, says to his people, he's very happy to say outright that the whole purpose of making war more humane is to end it. It's not worth doing unless it's an indirect strategy of pacifism. And of course, that opened the possibility for this intense debate about whether it was a plausible strategy. Uh, Leo Tolstoy, for one, doubted it. He doubted it uh, across like a whole range of, of areas of violence, actually. When it came to vegetarianism, he was very angry at people who ate meat as long as it seemed to be served to them or prepared um, far away from them so they didn't see the blood and if the animals had been treated humanely first. And his attitude to war was parallel, that those who wanted to make it more humane, especially if they were fooling themselves that it would lead to war's abolition, were mistaken. In fact, making such vile practices more morally, or at least visibly uh, tolerable, would entrench them. And basically, this larger project I'm undertaking is about how he was right and what we've ended up doing by making war more humane is entrenching a kind of warfare um, that's now endless and, and in certain ways, um, a placeless. At Nuremberg, after this false start of charging aggression at, uh, uh, at the end of World War I, there was a huge priority given to aggression. And I, I know that you all know this as experts, but I still think if we went out into the street and asked people what Nuremberg was about, they would likely say it's a Holocaust trial, uh, which is of course false. Um, uh, to the extent the Holocaust was given any attention, it was qu as a quite subsidiary matter within the charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now a novel charge denoting atrocity. And those crimes were in their turn given much less importance relative to the master charge of the crimes against peace. Now there are a lot of reasons why this happened and there's like a great literature on it. I recommend Donald Bloxham's book as the best one, but there's a, a Toronto professor named Michael Maris who's done a somewhat more generous depiction of why the Holocaust was missed largely at Nuremberg. Um, I think there were some good reasons why aggression was prioritized, especially by um, Americans, um, since uh, after the Soviets gave them the idea of prioritizing aggression, um, Americans uh, followed suit rapidly. Um, and the reason was a kind of greater includes the lesser reason. If you abolish war, you abolish war crimes, but the reverse isn't true. 
Uh, and those who watched the Nuremberg proceedings, like the then most famous uh, American law professor of the time, said so. Maybe you even attribute to these folks who were New Dealers a kind of complex causal sense about how atrocity occurs. It's only at the end of a causal chain. Uh, and of course, they thought in the 40s that the causal chain began with depression, not war, and war, not atrocity. So their master goal with respect even to Nuremberg, for example, how they thought about corporations, was to set up a, a kind of um, welfare state that wouldn't then devolve into uh, 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 war, let alone atrocity. So that's, the, that's a kind of attempt to, to save their priorities, um, although there are, as we'll see, there are, of course, many bad reasons. I had a student just do a tote board of how many times various phrases were mentioned in the umpteen volumes of the IMT transcripts, and like this is what you come up with. Um, like basically, concerns about aggression dwarfed um, massively concerns about everything else. Uh, I'll just mention those who mention human dignity, human rights, et cetera, were generally the Nazi lawyers who were complaining reasonably about procedural violations, which were, of course, rife at Nuremberg. Okay, um, so then we, if you buy all of that, and I've just done it very briefly, then, then as I say, you set up this twofold quandary. One, why did aggression fall? Two, why did atrocity rise? Um, now, there are, let's say, easy answers here, and I want to avoid them because I think they're too self-congratulatory. With respect to the fall of aggression, you might argue that, well, the UN Charter came. We fixed it. No more war, less war. You know, leave out Crimea, Iraq, Syria, you know, um, which I wouldn't want to leave out. But, you know, maybe you'd say, we, we did our best to solve the problem of interstate war. And at that point, we realized there's so much else left that we need not only to turn to the project of making the residual war more humane, but we need to penalize and, uh, and get those who, who perpetrate them as our highest end. Um, I, I think that's, that's self-congratulatory because the truth is, as we'll see, the aggression charge became something that was radioactive to those great powers who want to preserve uh, the resort to force in our world. Um, and uh, as, as we'll see, maybe they had some good reasons for thinking that the aggression charge was going to be radioactive precisely with respect to their conduct. So maybe the right way to think about this problem is to ask, why was there this one moment of history when the most powerful state in the world allowed aggression to be charged once. Uh, and I think that's actually a better way of thinking about it. Uh, but we'll, we'll pursue it as if it, we could think about this under this heading of the fall of aggression. And then we'll look at this, this second problem. Uh, because of course, had aggression fallen and, and nothing else followed, there might ne never have been international criminal law in our new, new reinvented version. And we have to explain why there is. And I think the answer um, lies in, in uh, a, a certain uh, rise of concern around atrocity. So in the paper, I go through a bit of, of history in the Cold War about why aggression was deemed to be more and more problematic, uh, including by Americans who were the, you know, who had, who'd made it a chargeable offense that one time. Um, there are intellectual critiques, and of course, there is a really long campaign to define aggression uh, in international law, which gets a lot of criticism. Whatever Hitler at all had done, it was clearly aggression. So at Nuremberg, there wasn't a big, let's say, problem in exactly defining it. And of course, that was, there were retroactive uh, benefits uh, at Nuremberg defining it after the fact, whereas once you have a, 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 a definition uh, in law, it becomes something you can, you can baselessly charge others with. And of course, um, the great powers, especially uh, ones who are in the phase of late formal empire or direct intervention like the Vietnam War in the case of a, a state like mine, 
um, are very worried by what they think the emerging post-colonial world will do with the aggression charge. Uh, I think it's false to think that post-colonial um, nationalists um, are just as interested uh, in banning aggression. Uh, uh, only uh, they, want, they, are, they are interested in it if they can redefine it first. Because of course, following Justice Paul at the Tokyo, Tokyo trials, anti-colonialists think that the world has been you know, a one long history of aggression. And in fact, more is necessary to set things right. Uh, and so their work in the Cold War is to define so-called liberatory wars as not aggressive. Uh, and anything the great powers do as the remaining aggression to police. But the great powers are not willing to think of aggression in those terms. Uh, and they're very worried by a world in which close to, with close to 200 states where they might get charged with this crime that they might have controlled before. Then there's this specific American story, which I tell in the paper, and I'll just tell it briefly here. Roughly, the Vietnam War is this great pivot, uh, I believe, in, in the overall story I'm trying to tell. Most of the argument in, in international law, both outside and inside the United States after the escalation of the Vietnam War in, in 1965 concerns who the aggressor really is and whether America is guilty of the crime it charged at Nuremberg. <coughs> after Mi Lai, reformist priorities begin to change. And a great barometer of this is Telford Taylor, who had been a famous Nuremberg prosecutor, who writes uh, in response to people like Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre, who have spent the last 10 years charging America with aggression uh, in the name of the Nuremberg precedent, the, the real one this time, not the false memory of, the, of Nuremberg as an atrocity trial. And Taylor says, this was a unique situation in 1945. We don't want to charge aggression in this case or ever again. Instead, let's focus on the incontestable war crimes Americans have committed. And, uh, and, and this is, I think, a, a, a bellwether of what's going to happen in the future. In any case, you have to explain why aggression craters. And I just, I don't, I can't explain this personally, but the phrase aggressive war has its peak in the 40s and then is in slow decline. War of aggression is, you know, coincides its peak with the Vietnam era, like maybe the young kids of that time just preferred that phrase. But it has a self same cratering phenomenon through our time, including you'll see after Iraq, uh, no widespread uh, use of this concept uh, to, to think about what's happening in the world. Then we turn to our second problem. Um, you know, I, you know, just in terms of the technical history of international criminal law, it's true that the Genocide Convention in its terms calls for an international criminal court for atrocity, uh, which is never set up. But international lawyers through the 50s actually trying to work on um, this field before they give up um, really do want to set up an aggression court. An atrocity court becomes only imaginable um, later. And I think we could debate when that is. There are some initial signs of it, like amongst reformers. I mentioned one in the 70s, but we really get this as a 1990s phenomenon. Um, and probably the two biggest factors causally are cultural change and geopolitical change. So let's talk about them sort of in that order. The cultural change um, is that people are programmed and re-educated to think atrocity is really, really, really important. Um, hadn't believed that in the 40s, clearly, and certainly not the Jewish a tra a tragedy because the world bypassed it uh, in the 40s. Uh, and then a geopolitical change, I think, much more important, and I'll, I'll try to explain how I think about that. You know, I'm not claiming these charts take us very far. They're, you know, the history of words just a proxy for big moral developments, but it's quite striking that the age of Holocaust memory uh, is the age of human rights um, and vice versa. And you might argue that this is also the age of the post-colonial state. So I think actually neglected in thinking about why people get concerned about the Holocaust is that there's new concerns about 
atrocity abroad in the age of decolonization and after, i.e. those occurring in post-colonial states. They're no longer subject to imperial rule. They're, 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 they're veils of tears where you see not Western violence, but indigenous violence, uh, especially by those who've used violence to defeat your empire. And you respond with a great deal of empathy uh, and want to punish the killers. I don't think that's an implausible cultural story, but you know, tell me what you think. Um, the geopolitical factors are, are, are kind of track this. International criminal law emerged, let's say, for a, a white bourgeois public concerned of great power wars which will involve the mass death of their own sons and brothers. Uh, and there's a huge priority in the 20s uh, and after World War II for great power peace. Because who dies in great power war? The wealthy and rich in the world. Uh, but uh, after you know, Bosnia, basically international criminal law, law is a, a, a project of post-colonial governance. It's, it's like a response to violence uh, and misrule abroad uh, and in the South. While the Northerners, especially after 9-11, do recommit to direct engagement in, around the world, especially the Middle East, uh, after decades of proxy war, they have cleansed their wars. You know, people get angry when I say this, but the war on terror is the most humane war ever conducted in history. It doesn't involve, it's terrible and brutal, but it doesn't involve a lot of atrocity relative to any war ever fought. Whereas post-colonial wars are definitionally brutal, at least to date. And so stigmatizing atrocity is de facto to stigmatize uh, wars in the global south. Now, partly that's just because of, of you know, northern, a northern decision that happens on both sides of the military-civil divide to make war more humane. This is Tolstoy's dynamic. After decolonization and Vietnam, which had been you know, horrendous in the way that northern armies fought, there's embarrassment and shame and even the military commit to humane war. And if you like, the human rights community, along with the humanitarian law community, helps them. Uh, you have like a strategic convergence of interests uh, and you get humane war as a result, except that it's endless uh, uh, after 9-11. Meanwhile, um, you have, you know, in a new media environment, the, the outrage of, of, you know, global atrocity, at least southern atrocity. So that's the story I want to tell. I mean, there's more in the paper. Let me just mention in conclusion three objections you might have, and I won't give any answers. This is like to prompt challenges, because I'm not sure about these arguments, and I'd be happy to, you know, hear they're wrong or there are other ways of thinking about, again, not all the factors, but the most powerful factors in accounting for the basic change in international criminal law. The reprioritization of, of it uh, and the fall of aggression uh, in, the, and in favor of atrocity. So first is that, as I mentioned and acknowledged, interstate war has fallen. So aggression is not as big a problem in the past. Uh, but again, it's still a problem. Uh, and it's not clear um, why, why, it, why it, it's, it's, it's um, purgation as the lead charge, the crime of crimes in international criminal law was tolerated. You might make some moral argument that aggression and its priority was from an age when we thought states and statehood was, was of normative importance as opposed to individuals and their suffering or their rights and their violation, however you think about it. So maybe the path towards atrocity was kind of paved by this moral revolution away from the belief that the collective insertion of individuals in states matters towards the view that it's the individuals themselves and their rights or at least suffering that cries out for attention. 
We should also acknowledge, of course, that if you, well, I haven't even talked about the ICC, but it's not as if the post-colonial states were uninvolved in setting it up. They were part of the like-minded coalition. But I believe we can say that they were fooled, um, just as a broad matter, uh, in the way that it, like the ICC has actually functioned. Um, and we know that among others, like really um, most states outside the US have, have struggled to integrate aggression as a charge. But of course, that's only happening now. And, and we, could, we could argue that the way it's formulated, contrary to US worries, probably makes it unchargeable as a matter of fact. Um, uh, and, but, and yet, the fact that it's, it's coming back is a potential objection. So yeah, those are my thoughts, and I'd love to discuss your views about um, where ICL came from. Yeah, sure. Okay, so just a reminder that the, for the recording, that I want you to speak into a mic when we ask a question. I'm not, I'm not a historian or criminal lawyer, so it's just random thoughts that okay, I want sure. to share. I don't know if they're of much value, but um, so um, first, maybe partly the retreat of aggression is because it's becoming more and more difficult to identify an aggressor. And you kind of alluded to this, to the fact that you can, can have sort of counter narratives and counter narratives. Yes. Uh, so World War II was easy to identify the Germans as aggressors, exactly. but, but it's more difficult to do this afterwards. Um, even when you have a sort of declaration of war, you can always have a story, oh, but this is a response to, this is sort of liberatory. Of so. Course. Um, second, so I did the engram for crime, uh, crime of humanity, just as you were talking, and it turned, and I found that, uh, and I'm sure you did this, that there are references from the 19th century, and then it's uh, the most common reference I found is to slavery, right. which suggests right. that actually something like what we would think now, so, so atro something like atrocity was something that was more popular in the middle of the 19th century in the Civil War context, and then aggression sort of suddenly comes up and disappears again. So in a way, perhaps it's sort of returning to yeah. what it was before. Um, third thought, um, law becomes humane because of self-interested reasons which involve less exposing our soldiers to risk. Actually, you can kind of just, you know, shoot that tomahawk and, and our soldiers are not uh, Correct, really. Yeah. So, so, and then the story could become kind of, we, uh, we are, we're doing the clean surgical war, but actually sure. to some extent it's to save our soldiers from. from of course, yeah. We, we ban atrocity because we don't need to commit yeah, it. Exactly. And, Correct. Well, that's uh, true though. And, okay. and final thought. Uh, <laughs> um, Aggressors are usually the, the generals. Uh, atrocities are often think of Abu mm -hmm. Ghraib mm -hmm. conducted by the you know the sergeants and and the uh, uh, privates. Um, it's easier to um, it's sure. it's a good mechanism for for uh, relieving the the generals from sure. responsibility um, by turning it to from by turning crime against humanity to the to the privates uh, by focusing good. on good good. Those are great observations. I'll just comment on them. Um, of course, it's true that, and, and in the Cold War, it became especially common to say that um, aggression is not tractable because it's really about, you know, it's a political argument about whose war is justified. And there was this one time when we'd already gotten rid of the other side and they couldn't give their own case or they tried to and it was so objectionable. Um, and it was just not controversial to charge aggression. Um, Whereas later, you know, the arguments from 1965 through nine or whenever you want to date it kind of bogged down because it's just, you know, your case for aggression against mine. Um, that's true. But the, th the thing is that that should have always been obvious. There is, we, we have to start with the original historical proposition that people in the past were as smart or as, or as smarter than we are, more, often more educated. Um, and they thought of this but they nonetheless chose to prioritize aggression. Um, now, I think that's because it's, people cared about war itself because it was affecting them you know, uh, in the global north. Um, and they, 
they, they got their statesmen with a lot of hypocrisy along the way to build in a, aggression as, as a norm in international law, um, which has then opened a lot of people to use in different ways. Um, and so I think the real reason aggression fall is it came to be perceived as dangerous to those hegemonic forces that want to go where they want to go and fight whom they want to fight. Meanwhile, these same forces can fight cleanly, uh, whereas others can't. Um, so I would say I, I'm not intending to deny that there's been atrocity consciousness earlier in history than our time. Uh, I don't think the example you cite is one because you know generally the phrase crimes against humanity um, in the 19th century um, what you know could be could be used in association with slaves, but it, it was it was about the practice of denying people citizenship, not about the particular acts of brutality that were inflicted. So again, like war later, slavery itself, the institution, was a crime against humanity. And in a way, that's incredibly radical um, because it's it's saying that there's this structure of oppression denying people freedom, you know, which is a crime against humanity. Not something like you know warlords, you know committing atrocities. Um, but you know, my, 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 my more general response is that there, there's, there's people are rightly all along, all through history, concerned about terrible things that happen to ordinary people. Um, it's just that that's like the subliminal note in this field, especially at Nuremberg, until it becomes the whole song. And why did that happen? I don't think aggression is so much about generals as about statesmen. But there, your argument is even more penetrating. Uh, so we, in my country, we commonly say we ended up having a national criminal law that's about letting white elites off the hook, even when they cause so much more pain, not just in their own country, but globally, whereas lots of black men are put in jail. Now, the very frightening thing would be to claim that the same thing is happening globally. Uh, and that international criminal law has gotten bound up with it. Now, the, the trouble with this argument is that we're indicting despots and warlords in Africa and elsewhere, hopefully, someday. Um, and those are powerful people. But then we say, well, they're the powerful among the weak. Uh, George Bush is not subject to indictment. Barack Obama is not subject to indictment. Uh, uh, but but some, some people are. And then again, just like with ordinary criminality, we might say, well, when people commit crimes, even if they're weak, they're crimes. But we should still ask, why selective prosecution? Uh, who, whose crimes matter most, et cetera? And, and there, I think your argument is very penetrating. Sure, yeah? Hi, uh, Ron Hi, nice to see you. Uh, so question is a part of it that made a cameo appearance. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, wondering if it's because of your theory of what's going on. So the Holocaust as cultural representation. Yes. Right? Makes a cameo appearance in slides. Um, and what, what do we see? We see that uh, Holocaust moves up basically with human rights history. Right? Correct. Uh, so this is one of the classic why you write the paper I'm writing. But, sure. But here's the paper here's the paper I'm writing. Okay, which sure. Is that the understanding of the Holocaust yeah. culturally yeah. shifts over time. For sure. And what you have, I think, implicitly is that that understanding is an effect of other geopolitical trends. Correct. Why? Right? So the Jeff Alexander moves or the sociological moves yeah. to say, no, the Holocaust changed as cultural object, yeah. moves from being unique to universal, sure. quite apart from geopolitical constraints. Sure. How would that change the story? If the story is one of representation, then shifting creating legal demand or legal interest, then creating professionals, et cetera, that's a very different, I think, account than one that's motivated by geopolitical constraints or geopolitical rationale that then produces a new representation of the Holocaust and with it new professionals. It's, it's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've written um, before um, about, the, about the relation between Holocaust memory and human rights in a chapter of this essay book called Human Rights and the Uses of History. And again, we, we get to delve into the details, obviously, like what, 
what was going on in you know, Biafra, Bangladesh, where there were charges of genocide, um, you know, even calls for humanitarian intervention, very little use of human rights, but be very beginning of appeals to the memory of the Holocaust in post-colonial settings. Um, a decade or so later, like with the very belated information about Cambodia, some things happening in Latin America, like Elie Wiesel is criticizing, you know, you get, you get a, a, a real sense that Holocaust memory is booming in the midst of a, a, a new you know, interest in violence in the global south. Um, and I don't, I, I don't think it's necessarily about universalization in the way that, uh, that Alexander presents it, um, because in, in a way, there were, there were quite universalistic understandings in the 40s of violence that weren't even focused on ethnic particularity, that swept ethnic particularity into like larger visions of, of victimhood and, and criminality responsible for it. Um, so what you really get in the later period, if there's universalization, is saying there's universalization of a norm that the worst thing that happens if, is if you're targeted because of who you are. Um, and yet even then, it's not universal. So I want to argue that the geopolitics matters insofar as there's, there's a selective attention in the rise of Holocaust memory to events in the global south. Um, when those events were happening, um, in the midst of the wars of decolonization, or indeed in the midst of the Vietnam War, not much attention. Remember, Jean-Paul Sartre at this Russell Tribunal writes like one of the pioneering invocations, not just of Nuremberg, but of genocide. Uh, but it has no traction, like Elie Wiesel doesn't stand up at that point and talk about the Vietnam War. But after that, after um, the great powers don't need to dirt dirty themselves in the ex in the post colony especially in this magic moment before 9 11 um, when all they're doing is proxy war you might say they're, they're they they can look out and see post-colonial tragedy and it's not of their making anymore uh, in their you know certainly not in their view um, so i think there's a, enough selectivity um, in the so-called universalization of the Holocaust in this period to make the geopolitics quite important. Um, is that a sufficient yeah, sure. answer? Okay. Mark. Yes. Thanks. Thanks very much. I, this is uh, illuminating. And I think it's, it's just great to hear somebody challenge the narrative on the on the crime of aggression as being just this legacy of Nuremberg as if there's like a straight arrow. I think one thing that tells us that that's not the case is the crime of aggression as adopted at the Assembly of States parties is unrecognizable to the one applied at Nuremberg. Course, it's just yeah. not the crime that anybody right. saw uh, right. back then. Um, I have a couple of uh, points and, and comments. Um, one thing I think is particularly strange or interesting is um, is the subset of states that end up supporting today the crime of aggression yes. uh, coming under the mantle or jurisdiction uh, or this definition at least coming under the jurisdiction of the ICC. And it's not one that you would expect. I mean, there are a couple that you might expect if you assume that states would want to have a, the crime of aggression uh, criminalized in order to protect themselves. Then you can say, OK, Croatia makes sense, Poland for historical uh, reasons make sense. Right. Palestine makes sense yeah. um, for political and legal reasons. But then, you know, Chile, Germany, Botswana, Liechtenstein, Samoa, you know, these aren't sure. historic, you know, are under much threat. Of course. Um, and the ones that don't support it are also slightly uh, odd. I mean, you might expect in geopolitical reasons that the U.S. wouldn't. But then you get Canada and Japan and, you know, nicer, like-minded group states sure. um, that do it. And I think um, the question is why? Why do you get these two camps at the end of the day? And I think that's part of the story as well. And I think yeah, there's I agree. three things that I that are perhaps interesting to note here. One is uh, that I think one of the issues that was perhaps missing slightly is the rise of humanitarian intervention 
and how states in particular, Canada, maybe the UK, France and others think about the crime of aggression as a potentially constraining force on their ability to do a Kosovo that's illegal but legitimate. That's one. Two is maybe more historically the, the creation of the UN Security Council. Um, and how relevant it has been as a political entity which constrain, is supposed to constrain the international use of force, one, and two, really wants to constrain any law, any law that the, U, that the International Criminal Court can invoke from atrocity crimes to the crime of aggression. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, the Kampala Amendment can only exist if you sacrifice opt-outs. Right. Uh, so a very weak law. Right. And what you get in return is the Security Council doesn't have the ultimate power over its application. And then thirdly, um, something that I find very found very interesting uh, being at the Assembly of States parties is something else, which I think only explains maybe the last bit, which is that supporters of the ICC, fervent supporters of the ICC are skeptical about the court having crime of a crime of aggression under its jurisdiction um, because they think it's the most political of crimes. The ICC shouldn't be more politicized. And in a sense, you also get this kind of uh, slightly insulting argument of of the court, which is it's not doing that well with the three crimes it already has. Let's not add uh, to its plate. And I think that's also a reason why you get this uh, reluctance. But just some comments and, and thanks very much for a great paper. No, those, I mean, I won't really respond because they're, they're just comments and, and, and my story kind of runs out in the present day. So um, I, I haven't even taken it on myself to try to explain the configuration of the like-minded states in the beginning, let alone, you know, what, what, who, who's voting at the Assembly of States parties for, for you know, the aggression amendments. Um, I mean, I would think the most obvious explanation for a lot of what happens is that states are willing to go along with the criminalization of acts they don't plan to commit. Um, and there are a lot of states, Liechtenstein, I mean, we know the person who's like, you know, there's an individual who's like really into the crime of aggression from there. But like historically, small states have been very interested in humanizing the world because they don't plan to brutalize it. Um, but, you know, that's not a good enough answer. That's like a threshold answer. And then we'd have to get into um, a lot of detail. Um, I think that, you know, certainly for my own colleague, Harold Coe, humanitarian intervention and, and its possible proscription by the rise of aggression is like central to um, his opposition and the U.S. government's opposition to these amendments. And that that's less true for some allies, but, you know, it's still part of the picture, as you point out. One of the really interesting things, um, and this is in Bill Chavis's book, is thinking about the return of aggression um, by those who favor it as attempted UN charter reform. So like the attempt to redo the bad deal of 1945 to take at least some power in the domain of war and peace away from those who monopolize it. Um, and that's like a really productive, I think, way of thinking about it, but whether it will succeed, especially given you know, the narrow chargeability and, and so forth is, is, is kind of another matter. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much for the paper, Sam, uh, and the presentation. Uh, really, really interesting. I had two somewhat unrelated questions um, that I was hoping to get your thoughts on. Uh, the first is taking the sort of context of the particular workshop here, yeah. being new trends in, in sure. criminal law. Um, I, I buy the story uh, uh, and, and find it very compelling um, with respect to trends in international law generally. Um, and one of my questions is why criminalize it, right? So yeah. why have we chosen these acts to be those that we apply a criminal sanction to? There might be a story here that explains why they've been the focus of international law in different ways. Um, and, and I think that that might speak to the book that you end up writing a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, but on this paper specifically, why have we decided to apply the criminal sanction to this conduct? Um, and can this story tell us something about that? Uh, and the, the other one uh, that I had, and, and I'm happy to chat about this a bit more, is I think that there's actually an interesting um, story about the ways in which uh, the crime of aggression is being recast 
almost in the contemporary mold of atrocity crimes. Um, so there's this kind of interesting reversal in which uh, the sort of contemporary atrocity crimes at Nuremberg are only seen as international if they're attached to the main crime of war, right? But now we have this way in which a number of scholars that are saying, no, we really should be bringing back the crime of aggression are saying we should do so right. because it actually fits our new model of atrocity right. crime, that it actually implicates rights in like a Tom very Dan fundamental way. Yeah. Dan Baum's article is yeah. you know, yeah. part of, of course, the school yeah. of, of, of writing yeah. uh, that Fred, Mc, Fred McRae and, and others have yeah. sort of been a part of almost unconsciously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it, it's just sort of interesting how the, the return of aggression isn't necessarily out of keeping with this right, mold. Right. Um, it, it kind of continues and crystallizes it. Right. Um, and so it'd be great to, to chat with yeah. you and hear. No, I'd that. love to chat. I mean, the, I'd rather talk about that one because the first, yeah. I'm kind of flummoxed by the first question. I mean, I, I, I think it's a great question, but maybe you can answer it. I mean, <laughs> like there's this general question of like, what, what do we think if we think a criminal sanction is is something that's about like a, a special opprobrium, collective opprobrium, state opprobrium, public opprobrium, then we have to figure out well why are these things are the the few acts that we, um, we we put in that category? I thought I was trying to tell a story about like how that box is there and it's created in international law, but what's in it changes pretty radically, and then that tracks this story about what the powerful in the world think is evil. Um, and that's sort of the very basic part of my story. And I'm trying to tell a story in which we don't think of like act, the activist community as somehow separate from the powerful states in which they live, but that they're all part of the same, uh, their same kind of moral consciousness. Um, as, as yeah, I'm go saying, ahead, like, please. Move on to the second question, uh, if that's a more interesting one. but. The you know the interesting about thing about international law is yes this this idea that we apply the, apply the criminal sanction to those things that have this kind of um, moral weight to them in, in the domestic context but you know there's there's all sorts of wrongs in international law and we usually have this structure in which we hold the state accountable right. uh, as state. Um, for most wrongs in international law. Right. Um, and so, so is it simply that we see these as the most royal, morally wrongful acts um, in international law and that's why we've decided to apply the criminal sanction and that's why we've decided to identify the individual as the wrongdoer? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or is there, I mean like, the, or is right. there some, something else going on? Yeah, like that's why really the criminal sanction? Because it's not simply that we've seen these things to be wrong as, or the only wrongs yes. in international law because we identify a whole range of other wrongs that we hold the state accountable right. qua state for. Right. But um, maybe I'll leave that Yeah, there. no, it's, a really, it's yeah. really interesting. On the second, I mean, I have this like footnote at the end in which, you know, I talk about the new natural, you know, the new, you know, uh, uh, just war theory and yeah. Dan bombs in yeah. there. But so, so I think something very significant happened, which is that the, the moral universe in which the crime of aggression made sense has, has fallen at least among, you know, what wealthy elites. Um, that universe is one where states were proxies for us. Uh, and they they also had independent kind of a more moral you know moral um, significance, um, and there's been a possibly justified critique of that worldview in the name of the kind of what you could call exclusionary normative individualism. That all the value in the world comes from the interests and rights of individuals, and states are just these technical intermediaries between like universal justice and entitled individuals. Um, and that's like Dannenbaum's view. But then the question is, well, why do you need aggression except to claim that your current project is consistent yeah. with the one you overthrew? And that's my basic question for like that article and just in general. It seems like almost as a matter of branding, it's, it's very important for some people to say that they're, they're not in such a breach of the original scheme of international criminal law um, by having so marginalized and omitted aggression. Um, now, certain people are fine with that development and still claim the mantle of Nuremberg nonetheless, which is outrageous. But um, the question is why claim the mantle of Nuremberg if you're gonna go on to redefine its content 
So that aggression really just means human rights violations anyway, which can be captured by, if not the current list, then some expanded list of atrocity crimes. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's not a good answer, but the question really helps us identify this, this moral change which is registered by philosophers. Um, and it forces those of us who think that, you know, um, something like endless humane war conducted by like a few countries, um, why it's, what's wrong with it as a normative matter if it's clean? Now, I have you know, answers to that that would involve like global hierarchy and the importance of the ethics of self-determination, you know, with collective entities, but those are moral propositions. Now, I'm not a philosopher, so I don't have to argue for them, but um, someone should, and it would mean resisting like the dominant trends of, you know, analytic philosophy in these areas yeah. um, from David Luban through Tom Dannenbaum, who are basically normative individualists, as if the whole you know world history of philosophy weren't pointing in a very different direction. Yeah, sorry, hey, Igor. So my, I have a more simplistic question. Okay. Uh, I'm from political science. I'm wondering, and you touched upon this, and also the first questioner asked, uh, the aggression is tied to the sovereignist model and the Westphalian system, right? You kind of concluded with that at different levels of analysis. And uh, atrocity is more individualist and so on and so forth. So maybe unpacking that would help a little bit because I think the upshot is that the, the states are no longer responsible for the aggression and why that you know, took place. It's, it's worth thinking about. And the other, I guess, point I wanted to say is, what is the normative purchase of your paper? Are you saying that we should pay more attention, retrieve the concept of aggression? Is that what should be done? Or do you leave that as an open question? It's, it's, those are great thoughts. And, and you, know, you, you probably have more to say about, about the first one than I do. Um, I, 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 let's acknowledge that, um, I, I would avoid the concept of Westphalian, but aggression comes from a time when people thought that, you know, states had things like territorial integrity and, and political independence as matters of right and wrong. Now, maybe it was always just as a proxy for the interests of those living as citizens of those states, even if they were second class citizens. Um, and the state was the most plausible representative of them. Um, it, it, and so we founded an international system and international law around states. Um, and of course, that's changed. Um, now, it's not changed as much as we think, because even when we say things like along with these philosophers, no, it's the individuals who matter. Only a state can conduct a humanitarian intervention or a concert of states authorized, in our law at least, by an intergovernmental authority if it's going to be legal and not just legitimate. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of this work is about worrying that in the age of humanitarian intervention, in the name of individuals, we're ratifying the power of certain states um, to conduct uh, uh, act activities that they might have all sorts of reasons to conduct, but now have a very good moral permission slip when we don't think states are, are of normative relevance and individuals exclusively are. Um, I guess that gets to your, your, your second question, which is that I, I'm, I'm trying to try to figure out, I mean, so imagine, you know, just project out 50 years. Now we tend to be concerned about post-colonial disorder. And of course it's terrible when people die because of it. And I'm not suggesting that atrocity is not wrong or that those who perpetrate it shouldn't be you know, brought to justice or anything like that. Um, but it seems like we're, we're, we're in the final stages of um, this other development, which we may in the end regard as much more frightening, which is the humanization of great power war. So if we are concerned about that, we still tend to say that what's wrong with it is that it's brutal. The drones miss. Uh, or they're, they're themselves too primitive, or there's undercounting by the Pentagon about how many die in, in you know, clean war, not just by drones, but you know, by special forces last year operating 
from my country and 150 others. That's three quarters of them. Um, and so we project forward into a world which, you know, if like you've read Michel Foucault is not like a surprising kind of contrast from a world where we used to think that it's brutality that's wrong, but what turns out to be even more sinister is humane control. Even as we, ha we drop an international law that's concerned with keeping powers, even great ones, within their borders uh, in the service of these individualist things that uh, have prevailed. Um, and so that's what I'm like thinking about. Is there something wrong with humane control? Because that's where we already are and will continue to get, get more, 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 more perfected uh, version of it as the years pass. I think there is. Um, whether it should be formulated in terms of like collective rights, you know, to self-determination or, you know, territorial integrity of states, in fact, run by clientelistic corrupt elites, I doubt it. But it seems like we should have some other concerns that, that lead us to worry about the rise of humane great power war. And like the most basic one is has to do with like the hierarchy of wealth and power in the world, whether conceived of as a matter of the interstate order or the inter-individual order. Um, and, uh, you know, the powerful and wealthy, whether states or individuals, don't suffer humane control. Everyone else does after empire. Yeah, I was, I was thinking it's like, um, suppose, you know, two people are playing a chess match. Yes. You know, with an audience. Okay. And somebody from the audience comes in and th starts to help one of the players. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, now, you might think, you know, the, the, str the, the stronger party will not, will, will think that's not fair. Uh, the weaker, weaker party may or may not think it's fair. Correct. Um, depends how high the stakes are. If it's life or death, then people are, you know, observers are going to have a different view of it, I think. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 and I'm just going by my reading of, you know, um, Second World War era newspapers and popular press and things like that. But I think um, the overall point I, I guess I want to make is that, you know, um, the big response to aggression was the war, not the military tribunals. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was the big response. And, and that was what had to be justified to the general public as why did we go to war? Of course. Right? Of course. Um, and, the, um, and, and the other question is, the other thing that it surprised me, when I, when I, when I went to look when it, once, once for the peace treaties that ended World War II, uh, there, there wasn't one with Japan until the 1950s. And of course, with Germany, that didn't happen until re, re, reunification. Uh, which is why the, it, it continued to be military tribunals right. <laughs> dealing with the situation. Right. Um, so the question is, once, once the Axis was no longer really a threat, yeah. what was the justification for carrying on with, with the hostilities? Good. <laughs> no, that's... That, and, and, and really, yeah. selling it in terms of atrocity makes more sense than aggression when people aren't anymore feeling under threat. Good, good. Thinking it's existential. Good. I think that's really helpful. And of course, I mean, it's, it sounds like it's, it's, you know, consistent with a kind of more realist view that whatever laws, it just ratifies what kind of power has reached um, and kind of states it as if it were principled and so forth. And um, now we can still ask, even on such a picture, well, why is it necessary? Uh, it sounds like at least some people want to believe that their world is moral. Um, and that it's based on, you know, principles and rules, even if declared after the fact, and they're perfectly consistent with whatever happened before. Like, you know, there's international criminal law, but it doesn't proscribe bombing Asians. Um, who knows why, but that's the way it is. Okay, so I, I, I think it's, it's a really, um, you know, good question. But I would say, you know, when I think about Nuremberg, um, you know, it's not that it didn't attend to atrocities, but that, it, it, it has to be explained why precisely in, in this view of yours, it placed aggression so high. Now I skipped this, but one reason is kind of mainly domestic. Within the United States, the Americans like Justice Robert Jackson, who was like the main representative of the US there, had broken the law, the domestic law of the United States, something called the Neutrality Act, trying to help Britain. And like, you know, it was very important to say it was right to do so. And so like Nuremberg, I talk about this in the paper, but it's just a small moment, is, was really in a sense about retroactive justification for domestic illegality. 
but it was also prospective because the idea was to say, Americans, we've now committed to being a global security force after we'd never done so. And the reason we've done so is that, you know, we had to put down this one last threat to world peace. And you need to understand that there was this high principle on which we did so. And of course, you know, thereafter, you know, the U.S. always said in the Cold War that the next war was the last war to put down the last aggressor. So it was very good then prospectively to have this reason to cite um, for those who remain powerful, at least up to a certain point, um, on the so-called isolationist side of American politics. Now, we shouldn't leave the Soviets out because they're like really important in this too. And I, I think it's been shown that some of their jurists like Aron Trenin like really came up with the aggression charge and brought it to the Nuremberg, uh, the London charter meetings and so forth. But they have their reasons. Different people have their reasons. Europeans want like they've lived through like France and Germany, you know, you know, having this generational spat. 1870, 1914, 1940. Can we please stop, you know, stop the these brothers from, you know, and so aggression is going to stabilize the European European security uh, zone as well. Um, so these are all are really consistent with your story. Um, what a what's not the problem is atrocity, mainly because, like, you know, Americans did bomb, you know, firebomb Tokyo. And like a lot of people killed Jews, you know, who weren't, you know, weren't necessarily like, you know, anyway, so lots of people in France who, you know, didn't have to kill Jews, etc. Yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you for speaking. Um, in an attempt to sort of find that thread as to why there may be a reinvigorated interest um, in uh, you know, in, a, in aggression, especially from these decolonial states, um, and you know, recalling the piece you wrote in response to Paul Kahn's um, article on imagining drones, in which drones are sort of the logical continuation of clean war in this post 9/11 era. Um, do you think that could somewhat be a response to the kind of changing and redefining of um, use ad bellum, where, you know, drone strikes in a foreign territory without the authorization of that government, um, you know, doesn't actually constitute um, an act of war necessarily. Um, and so trying to sort of uh, get, get ahead of that or respond to that by be, you know, by trying to reimagine that um, aggression in a way that would bring something like uh, drone strikes sort of into the fold. Yeah, yeah, that, that, so we'd have to ask. I mean, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I hope it's not the case that the, you know, we could ask Mark who may know better and others, but that, that those states that are pushing for the restoration of aggression to international criminal law have a secret plan to charge the United States for drone strikes. I mean, that's not even remotely plausible. Um, but maybe it's like, maybe you say, well, just having like this norm around, it's clearly is scary to a lot of like, people in the United States to the point that they've pushed back really hard. Now, again, I think it's mainly because they want to preserve the option of humanitarian intervention. But of course, in the back of their minds is a world in which, you know, we've all taken international law, you know, I mean, the pra state practice kind of coalesces around a norm about not crossing borders. The U.S. and its allies have been really successful about weakening those rules you know, un the unwilling and unable revolution that it sponsored and now gotten its allies to agree with, which is in part about, you know, um, the, you know, n these new forms of war that are relatively more humane, but more geographically expansive. Um, but still, maybe I think that's a very powerful hypothesis that somewhere in the picture is a fear that the international legal order will will somehow prescribe the kind of humane control that that is being operationalized now, um, and and even just having the word around for other purposes is threatening. Um, I think that's very plausible, um, even if it's let's say not a realistic fear um, anytime 
soon. Yes. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that you you brought out in the comments more than in the paper itself, okay, but it sure. comes up in yeah. an earlier paper as well okay. on on the historical narrative, which is about the sort of collective versus individual yes, yes. framing. And I just was thinking about in the post Nuremberg, post World War II era, there is another story going on, which is much less sexy than the criminal law yes. atrocity story, yes. and that's the the story of state responsibility, which yes, yes, which. That's right was picked up on. So the the crime of aggression was very much there in the, in the 1970 Friendly Re Relations Declaration. Absolutely, yeah. It was there front and center. Sure. And then up until 1996, in the draft of the IOC's articles on state responsibility, the primary state crime was aggression. That was the, the right. first and center. And But by 1996, what's happening is negotiations for Rome. And it becomes to, as you much of your analysis brought out, it becomes much too controversial to leave yes. this concept of yes. state crimes in. Yes, interesting. So they get rid of it. Yeah. They move with peremptory norms instead, and then yeah. we said, well, we'll leave this to the criminal law world. But by right. that, by the 1990s, what, what aggression is, is exactly as you comes out of your talk, yeah. a far too controversial thing to even include in yes. the Rome statute without right. any contro controversy. And then you get the, the fumbled mess that is aggression that's in the Rome statute. That's, I'm sure there's a question that's really there, interesting. Just to, I mean, no, no, that's brilliant, uh, brilliant. I mean, as I said, like, um, yeah, no, I mean, in, in, in at least a first phase, you know, post-colonial states are, are interested in, in like the most kind of protected sovereign borders ever erected in world history, but they want to weaken those that can be said to, to be, you know, the legacy of colonialism. Like, you know, a classic example of that is like the, you know, invasion of Goa in the early 60s and, and the annexation uh, of Goa, which you know would presumably be aggression by any definition, except that it's in the name of you know Indian self determination and against colonialism and so forth. Um, but thereafter, I think you, you're right that looking at at the evolution of thinking about state responsibility is a really cool place to look, especially since uh, if anyone ever does write, like it won't be me, but a, like a definitive account of the of the geopolitical origins of the Rome statute. Um, it's not as if they didn't know, like not the mythology, but the people in the room, you know, knew that aggression had figured in major ways in their own tradition that they were allegedly trying to revive and in fact reinventing. And they thought, I mean, it would be fascinating to kind of think about how, how it was rationalized at, at, in, in these various stages. Um, because of course it hadn't mattered as much at, at the stage of ICTI and ICTER and so on, because there's, those are in, in internal conflicts. But if you're setting up an ICC, no reason it shouldn't really be the heir of Nuremberg and include this crime. And, and, and I think you're getting at, at like the preparatory work, which is immense in a sense between the 70s and the 90s that kind of tee up, tee up this uh, decision. And, and that, that's a brilliant, uh, Set, set of insights about where we could look for, for these crucial developments. Okay, sure. Um, um, so you said about how there's this incredible potential for. Um, for humanizing uh, warfare yes. in regards to brutality and atrocity in, in that yes. sense. My question is, I'm trying to sort of converge the ideas of, um, of America's penal system, the national yes. penal system, which sort yes. of allows for elites to, to be immune to certain punishment. And I'm trying to understand that in regards to the whole international penal system and how the focus is on African states at the moment. And that's why it's coming so much under so much criticism. So yes. I'm trying to understand the whole entire sort of legal order in terms of the rule of law and holding all states a accountable in terms of as equal sovereigns, equal sovereigns, sorry. And, um, and if you could speak a little bit about um, the whole uh, selectivity and prosecution, because right. I'm I'm not really understanding how we have an international uh, legal system that's so biased in a sense. It's a very visibly and politically partial and yes. and not at all um, independent. You know, 
I mainly, you know, I sometimes traffic in these inflammatory, you know, thought experiments. And, and, and this is a kind of an outrageous analogy to liken mass incarceration of black men in the United States to the ICC's, you know, exclusive focus on African uh, Africans. First of all, because a lot of the people in jail in the United States did nothing or very little. Whereas every one of those indicted by the ICC is, is, is you know, a horrible killer. Um, but, you know, the analogy mainly breaks down, as you've suggested, because the domestic and international legal order are different in one major respect. Um, at least in most states, you know, the government has control over, you know, and if it has national laws, they cover all of the territory. Whereas the international system is opt-in. And even for those states that haven't opted in, uh, like, you know, in the case of, you know, Bashir or someone like that, there's no global police that has control over the territory and can kind of execute the will of the prosecutors. Um, so we have, you know, and, you know, and, and, and the United States is not in the system either, you know, maybe as a beneficent friend on some accounts. Um, so this seems to me, if you really wanted to pursue the analogy, you know, based on maybe you say a remarkable similarity in over enforcement relative to certain kinds of people at the domestic and international level, you'd face some hurdles. Um, and, and the biggest one in my mind is not that the situations are too different like with respect to the, let's say, those targeted by over enforcement, though there are big differences, but mainly this difference in, I don't know, in let's say the nature of each system, that states are defined um, by control over their, 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 at least they have legal authority over their territory. Um, whereas international law, it, you know, if you have a Rome statute, only those who are parties or who can be even theoretically subject to jurisdiction through the Security Council are part of the system. And then that means at least five countries are, you know, will never get charged under that, you know, under Security Council referral and so forth and so on. Um, I read a few articles about um, how a lot of African states have this the new wave on democratization, sorry, I can't say that word, and, um, and the whole uh, constitutionalize, constitutionalization of African countries, a lot of uh, heads of state are not actually held in the same, um, in the same standard as all other citizens. Right. And how does the ICC get over this sort of impasse on head of state immunity and uh, in the, in, in, an international rule of law, which is really right, sort right. of biased. No, these are great questions. I mean, others know more about this, honestly. And actually, most of what I've been saying, you know, please chime in if you have a group discussion, if you have a better answer. Yeah, Mark. Um, I, I, I suppose I won't directly try to say anything to that. But I do think it's interesting. I think something's interesting with the crime of aggression here. Mm -hmm. Which is that if you have, if it's true that the ICC is biased against African states, right? And then you listen to what their more inflammatory re rhetorical concerns are, which is that there's no justice for Bush, there's no justice for Blair, there's no justice for the Iraq war. Um, <coughs> and in some ways you could say, well, they're making a claim about, yeah, maybe war crimes, but they're actually making a claim about the illegal use of, uh, of, of international law right. or the abuse of international law. They're making a claim about the crime of aggression. Right. Which I think gets us to an interesting question, which is then, if that's the case, why is Botswana the only country in the world since the Rome Statute who's really kind of pushed forward on the crime of aggression? Why yeah. wouldn't you, as an African state, yeah. challenge yeah. the ICC and major powers by saying, "We're, you know what, we're the ones who are actually sure. gonna, we're gonna own this"? Right. Um, which maybe brings me, I, I guess that's more of a comment, but it brings me to a question, which um, maybe. Uh, is more historically relevant to your work um, in, in this paper, which is who are the cheerleaders for the crime of aggressions, both the bad ones and the good ones? Because 
for war crimes, crimes against humanity, you know, you do have stress era, you do have right. uh, certain people and you have really, you have the negative cheerleaders. You do have an yeah. Eichmann during this time. You do yes. have um, a Klaus Barbie. You do have the Junta trials. You do have a Pinochet. Absolutely. You have a, con a public PR like consciousness of war crimes and crimes against humanity. You do. And in this period, you have Ben Ferencz who really comes to the fore actually in the later years, not during the Cold War. You don't really have the cheerleaders were positive and negative, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, you know, the good and the evil side of yeah, this to keep yeah. it in the public consciousness. I think that's really helpful. So that both things you said are really helpful. I, you know, some at some point, if we ever can have like adequate archival or interview information, it will be really interesting to explain the behavior you know, of African states, not as a block, but just one by one, because they're all very different. Um, like and and choices they've made, you know, over time. Um, you know, really interesting to think about and 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 even just speculate about in the absence of good evidence. Um, you know, I would say, you know, it's very important to remember that, like Ben Ferenc, while now like uh, the poster child of the you know ICC or international criminal law, um, and having been like given as a twenty six year old, like the you know power to try, you know, the Einsatzgruppen, like the main atrocity trial, if you like it, in, in the successor trials. Um, spent most of the Cold War like doing these self, almost self-published books about aggression and the need to criminalize it. And he hasn't forgotten that. Um, it's just that he was like selectively heard as a voice for, um, you know, for uh, you know, international criminal law. And, and also allowed himself to become affiliated with with a project that was only selectively interested in his own agenda, um, which is kind of un, un, an unerring agenda from the 60s to the present. Um, I would say more generally though, we have to think about like why the cause of peace fell um, because it was of great prominence. And if we are interested in things like the in, you know, co-application of, of human rights and humanitarian law today, like big debate we didn't really touch on. We have to remember that like in the 1980s, there were people trying to develop a human right to peace. So we're, you know, with generational change from like roughly the Vietnam War generation still in touch with like peace move, the tradition of peace movements uh, and our time, something big happened. And it's basically the disappearance of, of the cause of peace um, no big peace movement, like one day of it after 9-11 in the United States. And, and really, generally, European states have been allowed by their publics to go along with the post-9-11 innovations of the United States and in all of these areas. Um, I would say, you know, um, it, you know in, in the end, it must be the case that we think that our ancestors were confused. Um, they hated war because they thought war had to be brutal. Uh, and so they adopted peace because they thought that starting wars, you know, was the worst thing you could do. Now it turns out that they are perceived to have been wrong. And now we believe that you can have all kinds of interstate use of force that is surgical, hygienic, uh, not perceived at all, or when perceived, not perceived to be outrageous. Um, and uh, if that's happened, then maybe we just need to kind of go back and say what we thought was wrong about war wasn't wrong. Uh, uh, actually, it was like some consequences of war that have proved eliminable. Now, I don't want that to be the outcome because I think humane control is like worse than all of it um, because it's about domination. Uh, and domination is worse than atrocity. So, but obviously p people don't agree with me because they're setting the priorities and I'm not. Yes. So I'm not sure I agree with the rest. But okay, yeah. But leaving that aside, I'm trying to think, well, so Judith Schrader, right after her, yes. says the crime Though yeah. Term, sure. Uh, is the only moral foundation of the trial. True. Right? So I don't know if Strong is right either, but it's an earlier claim. It right? it is, yeah. It's early on claim 
Yeah, sure. Regression needs to, but it's, to, it's Taylor's claim. Yeah. Totally, totally right. So, so what else? So, if that's right, if that starts to happen earlier, or people are uncomfortable earlier. Yeah. What's happening? But here's another different argument, which is, and I'm, I'm surprised given your other work on liberalism, I didn't hear that as well, right? That there's a sense in which the crime of aggression, even if we could hold individuals responsible for it, et cetera, is more, is more belief. We had to create the court reform for it. They had to join the criminal enterprise. Yes. To find ways to get there. Yes. And trust me, for whatever reason we can decide what that reason is, yeah. um, appears to us more individuals. Now, I don't know why that is. Yes. But let's black box that. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, and it's. So that instead of a Holocaust and human rights consciousness story, you'd have a kind of neoliberalization story. Yes, OK. Uh, that would then produce the shift. We'd have to ask again, why is it these things and not others? I don't have an answer to that. But why isn't that part of this story? It's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I, I have, it sounds like that'd be very interesting to think about. Um, I'm not an entire, I do agree that Schlar kind of anticipated us. It's just that she's a voice in the wilderness and no one knows who she, you know, reads that book and so forth. Um, but of course, it's always, it's very possible to reach the conclusion that aggression is a mistake um, and that crimes against humanity, if, any, if anything can justify international criminal law, that's the charge. Now, I think factually she was wrong in her justification of the Nuremberg trials that Germans were so appalled by what they'd done that they like embrace liberalism. That's, that's like not factually correct, but it, even so, she could be right that other, you know, in other settings, um, the focusing on atrocity could have this mind-boggling effect to people and cause them to embrace the myth of the rule of law as like one part of like a a, a good society. That's basically her argument in legalism, as you know. So, um, I'm just not sure that explains the 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 later events. I mean, I agree it's a rationalization for people who embrace the later configuration, but it's like it's a philosophical position ultimately that's right or wrong and you know whether it's causal for all of these people wearing Joseph Coney bracelets, I just doubt. Um, but then we get to how to explain all those people. And you know, of course, ICL in our version is part of, you know, the reign of Angelina Jolie and Bill Gates and you know that brand of, of identifying with humanity. And it's very interesting to think about how we could make out the connections. Um, I, I just know that when I believed much of this stuff in the 90s, um, you know, it was the case that even if I was a neoliberal in fact, I felt so compelled by Holocaust memory as kind of having set the frame of our orientation to global affairs, that that I feel that that there's there's much more causal reason to look there um, than elsewhere. But again, I, I'd really love someone to look into this further. Yes. Uh, so there was a sort of line of thinking that, that I even mentioned in my, in my question, which yes. kind of suggests that the shift, the, suggest that the shift from atrocity to, sorry, from aggression to atrocity kind of helped the, the powerful nations. Um, and I don't want to deny it in part because I don't know, but, but here's an alternative suggestion for why it uh, sort of the endless but surgical war is, is something that we, we can live mm -hmm. easily with. And it's sort of line of research that ha that comes from moral psychology about just how people react to, to um, burglary versus white collar crime, uh, to theft versus downloading of, uh, of music illegally. Um, so, um, it's simply, in some sense, 
and I know it's a loaded word, natural for us to be more appalled by sort of something visible, visceral, which is brutality, which, uh, and, and, and much less so with you know, white collar crime, even though potentially it causes much greater harm to, to a, a much larger number of people. So in some ways, perhaps, there is a sort of uh, another story that, that can help uh, explain. It's not inconsistent with, with, with yeah. the one that it yeah. was also comfortable for the powerful nations. But for example, it's something that allows lots of people who are not in power to yeah. live with uh, the endless but uh, clean war yes. and sleep at night with it, uh, whereas be very troubled by yeah. atrocity. I think that's really insightful. I mean, I think first we'd have to decide like on theoretical grounds whether we believe in something like an invariant psychology. Like I, I, I don't, but that's because like I just have read the wrong books. But it's, it, let's say that's true, then it would be very interesting. Um, and it would explain a lot in, in this story. I mean, it, I think we'd have to grapple with the fact that um, people in the 20s and the 40s had seen a lot of terrible things with their own eyes, and yet they prioritize peace as, 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 the, as the end. And so I, I think that's compatible with your view, but, and, but, but go ahead. The answer to this. Okay. Said, and I think that's very interesting, that back then the thought was that you couldn't have one without the other. Right, so, right. so we have to stop war to Good. prevent. Whereas nowadays when we kind of found the way, so to speak, yes, to disaggregate yes. the two, we can say, oh, we can go on with wars forever as long as. So. Yes, yes. I think that's, I think that's very, very good. Um, so in, in a sense, precisely when we say, we usually say after the Holocaust, people were stricken with you know, depression and so forth, they were actually optimists because they believed that they could do something like end war and therefore end the thing they cared about, war crimes. Whereas we don't believe fundamentally in an end to two things, one civil war, two great power hegemony. And so we live with a project that is much less ambitious. It's not about dealing with either thing it's about dealing with atrocity when its perpetrators are weak. Uh, and that suggests that it's consistent with our hatred of, of the horror we see, but on, only some of it and not thinking about broader structural remedies um, uh, or, or, bro or, bro or some kind of broader, broader justice. Okay, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. We don't have to take the whole time. I'm, you know, people are. It's hot. No, I don't. Well, I, so this is a, I, I mean, really just a random half big thought. But I and I, and I know that you're. Uh, so I agree with basically. I mean, you know, as you know, the large part of your commitment to this um, particular question. I guess I, I've I've always thought about the norm. So in part, the importance of the framing of aggression in the way, I mean, to the extent that it was, I mean, so there was never actually defined at Nuremberg. Of course, we just talked about the badness of, uh, of Nazism or fascism, depending mm -hmm. on how you would construct it. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and so we, they, the, the concern, in other words, was not solely structural. It was a concern with substantive, it gets co quite complicated, of course, with construing the relationship of the Soviet Union to the Americans at this right. time and right. in the immediate aftermath. But I think there was, a discernible, substantive political commitment embodied within the crime of aggression in a way that makes it, I mean, of course, com is completely absent from the way we talk about atrocity and in even absent in, in an even more important way in the way we look at the new Kampala amendments or whatever, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So so in other words, you're abs I think you're, as you know, completely right that the turn to atrocity performs a depoliticization that wasn't easily available with the turn to aggression. But as you know that I know, there, I think there's also a deep politics going, yes. substantive commitment to the non-commitment to substantive politics, yes, if you know what right. I'm saying, right? So the, right. So the, there's a flippage, right? And, and, and you can parse, I mean, of course, one, you, you can easily parse this in terms of um, just neoliberalism and great power hegemony. 
Right. But I wonder if there's something a little bit more substantive we can say about the political constellation of the current frame that allows, or not allows it to happen, but encourages us to live in the mo in the in the less ambitious moment that we're in mm -hmm. from a from mm -hmm. a directly political. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's right to say that, you know, even if you want to make claims about deep politicization, that it's really rival political projects. Yes. And we should kind of bring out what yeah. those are. I would say if we want to get I mean, this is sort of in this new book I'm coming out with about human rights and, you know, political economy. But I think Nuremberg actually fits very snugly in a kind of welfare state paradigm. Um, like it's it's it, especially with regard to like you know, the, what's done with corporations at Nuremberg, as I mentioned in passing, it's about like, you know, the setting up of like welfare states that, um, you know, benefit white male workers sufficiently that they don't turn to populace. Um, and that was seen to have been the problem in 1933. And therefore, like, Nuremberg was, if you like, really about the Great Depression as much as it was about 1933 or 1940, 1942. Mm -hmm. um, in our day, we're much more concerned not with material equality, but with, 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 if with equality at all, status equality. And I'm shocked that not only did I not mention, but no one else mentioned gender. Um, but we, of course, think that, that the new international criminal law, unlike the old, has this virtue that it's about recognizing, recognizing the agency, uh, or at least the potential victimhood of women, at, not just as like part of you know the you know the 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 family wage and the welfare state, but as like independent entities and people who need to be protected in conflict zones, since after all they're the they're the most subject to depredations and so forth. So this seems like. It's consistent with like a certain um, like lean in feminism that what really matters is status equality. And in particular, you know, your body as the vessel for better or worse of your high status as a, as a neoliberal subject um, or any kind of subject. So um, this, you could take this in really interesting directions and I'd like totally omitted that, but um, it I guess, you know, I'm dealing with such like high level, you know, high level categories that we have to understand that what could count as an atrocity also change radically between the <laughs> 40s and our time and why we care about it change radically. Um, you know, of course, children died in the Holocaust and there were the kinder transport and so on. But we really care about those warlords and you know, who engage in, you know, conscription of teenagers. Uh, and that's a, that's a, that's like a horrendous crime in and of itself that we care about in ways that our ancestors would not have done. Um, and so this is all, this would be really interesting to pursue. And of course, kind of teasing out the politics of this and trying to justify it. I'm for status equality, not, you know, material equality seems significant, but status equality is not insignificant. So I think there's a huge amount to say in favor of our international criminal law in just this respect. But the question is, what, it, what, are, what is the cost of the turn to it? Could we imagine an even more capacious project that um, doesn't lose hold of, um, you know, the old aggression um, the welfare state framing of international criminal law, if you're willing to go there with me and so forth. Well, thanks for hearing me. I appreciate your, you know, time and interest.